My father shined his own shoes. My father shined his own shoes when he didn't have any money. And he shined his own shoes when he did. That is one of so many lessons I did not learn. <laughs> My father was a financial planner, literally and the other way. He began by selling life insurance and later bonds, mutual funds, and annuities. I say bonds, mutual funds, and annuities, nodding like this to hide from you the fact that I don't know what those are. <laughs> My father pe helped people plan for their retirement and taught them to be careful and not to spend every dime the moment they made it. I'm not saying that I have that tendency. I'm saying that's exactly what I do. <laughs> My father passed away 13 years ago and I miss him. I'm forced to believe that if he were still around, his influence would have transferred to me more completely. I dress like him, that's about it. <laughs> I'm not saying that when my father was perfect, he once home alone in the early 80s, figuring that our new microwave was just a newfangled toaster oven, put in it on high for 10 minutes a piece of quiche. <laughs> and went and took a shower. <laughs> Charcoal is what happened. He wouldn't have liked all that technology has become to Tay. My father was the guy that after months of begging him would finally bring home last year's latest gadget once the price came down, a new answering machine, for instance, and say to me, make this work? <clears throat> he was infinitely handy, but didn't care for the new stuff. And he wasn't cheap, just calculating. Were he alive today, my father would still be using a 10-year-old cell phone. And guess what? It would be in great shape, and it would work just fine. You'd say, but Dad, you can't get the internet on that. And he would say, good. <laughs> I think of my father when I think about this recession that we're in. There's something about the recent economic downturn that has me really nostalgic. Turning back to the days of my youth, looking for reminders of a happier, steadier time. Through the wonders of iTunes, I've been listening to music from when I was in junior high and high school. I've been going through some old boxes, looking through old photos and reading some of my old writings. I wrote some awful shit. <laughs> I don't want to go too far into it, but Girls really liked me, and I now have the letters to prove it. <laughs> girls would not have liked me, though, had they seen the pages and pages I wimpily dedicated to wondering if girls liked me. <laughs> the recession we find ourselves in hasn't really affected me, not like it has for others. I mean, I didn't have any money in the stock market to lose. In fact, I don't have any money. <laughs> Again, I, I just dress this way. I have stated many times that I don't understand anything about anything. If our early civilization had been left in my hands, it would have died out inside one generation. Also, I procrastinate and am easily distracted. I had to force myself to turn off last night's tivo episode of Dog the Bounty Hunter to write this today. It's a, it's a good one, too. Looks like he gets the guy. <laughs> In any case, I don't know anything, but I will say that when I hear economists on CNN or Meet the Press or This Week with George Stephanopoulos talking about the economy, the stimulus package, TARP 1 and TARP 2, I can't help but feel that they're just making shit up. <laughs> or, or even worse, arguing about things that are simply unknowable. They're fighting over whether the administration's plans will put us nine or only six trillion dollars in debt makes me think of cavemen arguing over the exact distance in miles to the sun. <laughs> I think it's 98 million. 98? It's 96, jackass. <laughs> that is how they talked. <laughs> My math is fine, but to me, the difference between six trillion and nine trillion is zero. <laughs> I still reserve the right to be judgy about it, though. Like today, when British Prime Minister Gordon Brown said from the meeting of the G20 that over time, they plan to inject five trillion dollars into the global economy, I was like, five trillion? <laughs> if I had money, I'd buy houses in Detroit. You can buy a house in Detroit right now for $300. <laughs> Truly. Not mansions, mind you, but if you buy enough of them and connected them all with breezeways. <laughs> Of 
course, I don't have any idea how much a breezeway costs. <laughs> I love Detroit. I lived in Detroit from 1997 until January 2001, and even back then, it was hurting. I lived downtown in a neighborhood that bordered one where scores of houses burned down in the 1967 riots hadn't been touched, much less rebuilt. There are some neighborhoods where the burned out buildings have been raised, and there, there will be an entire city block with only three or four houses on it. The rest, just open scrubland. It's, it's the oddest thing you've ever seen. I don't know what will happen to Detroit. I don't know if our auto industry can make itself over into a gas electric hybrid or plug in electric mecca. I pray that it can. There is, of course, talk about GM and Chrysler going under, going bankrupt, closing altogether, which is mind blowing. I wonder what would happen to all those American auto workers who would be out of work and quite likely their homes. I wonder how that would accelerate the influx of foreign automakers, especially Tata Motors from India. I wonder if Chrysler and Dodge do go out of business, what kind of car assholes will flock to next? <laughs> <laughs> You see, it is my firm belief that both the Chrysler 300 and the Dodge Charger were, from inception, designed specifically for the low-budget thug segment of the American car buying public. You can put whatever kind of shiny tractor-sized wheels on it you want. It is not now, nor will it ever be, a Bentley. <laughs> and it makes you neither fast nor furious. <laughs> my wife just started her own business. She's a, uh, she's a veterinarian, a cat doctor specifically. And back in December, she opened the cat practice in Marina Del Rey. It's a clinic just for cats and is a place about which I'm really proud. It's not a typical vet office. Beth went out of her way to make it a calming, soothing, spa-like, state-of-the-art place with appointments long enough and spread apart to really offer top-notch medicine. I don't mean to oversell it, but if you have a cat in Los Angeles <laughs> and you don't go to the cat practice in Marina Del Rey, you hate your cat. <laughs> That's not me talking, that's science. <laughs> now I don't mention this because Beth's owning and running this clinic somehow gives me renewed respect or unique insight into the world of the small business owner and the plight of this oh so important engine of commerce we hear so much about. I mention this because the economy is in the shitter and marketing is expensive. <laughs> www.thecatpracticela.com <laughs> I just got advertising for free. I believe my dad would be proud.